Good afternoon. Yes, that is me. Um, I was away when the people, my colleagues, my friends, my friends in the office did this for me. I actually got that off my Facebook page. <laughs> Far out. Um, so that was a good, that was a bad day. Today is obviously a good day, as you can see, much, much better looking. Uh, but before I go any further, a couple of acknowledgements as a, a mediocre middle-aged white man. Um, I do acknowledge that the land we're standing on doesn't belong to me. Uh, I see Indigenous people in the room, traditional owners. I see you. I see you over there. And uh, I'd like to say for my team, at least, uh, we can hear your voice as well. So uh, what I'm going to talk about now is uh, basically Iron the Reef. Does anyone know how to use this? Which button do I press? The big green one. Look at that. All right, stewardship. I'll probably say in front of the microphone, eh? how about that? I tend to want to walk around a little bit. So I'm here to talk about site stewardship. And uh, I, the, the, the second thing I need to uh, acknowledge uh, is that this is not my slide. This is my boss's. This is Fiona Merida's slide, the uh, wonderful, indomitable Fiona Merida. And she is flat out like a lizard drinking. So she sent me up here to uh, present her work for her and, and the team. So... This is a, this slide here just talks about uh, the sort of background, it goes right all the way back to the Act, the regulations that stem from the Act, the zoning plan, which stems from the regulations and so on. And the stuff that I've highlighted there as we get further down the list to get into the nitty gritty and down into the, the good stuff. That's the stuff that we're interacting with there. So the high standard tourism operators, uh, Iron the Reef, obviously, and tourism management action strategy and site stewardship down there, as well as my, my mob, the master reef guides there. So brief history of time uh, of, the, of the, where we are. I won't labor this, but we're talking more towards this more recent end down this way where the green dots are. So the Reef Protection Initiative and uh, Industry Training Capacity Building, which is basically my, my job description there. Uh, but you can see a bunch of things moving along the top there that the time frame is out. 75 was way back there. The time's compressing as you come towards this way, if that makes any sense. So uh, you can all read, so I'm not gonna read it out because you can all read, but that in a, in a nutshell, nutshell, is what uh, the site stewardship framework is. I'm gonna try and be less ASPE as we go along, forgive me. All right, so this, very simply, the, the five points here is what we're talking about when we're talking about the site stewardship framework, the principles, the five pillars or principles, if you like. First of all, Obviously, protect your site. Do no harm, just like the doctor's Hippocratic Oath. Do no harm. But the second one, we move into know your site and then make sure you get your damn message right. No matter what you're doing, get your message right. After that, there's a whole bunch of other things we can talk about. So if we went through those uh, do no harm and, and so forth, we come up with that sequence, as I just mentioned. Once you've done those three in the sequence, those are prerequisites for what we're imagining as a site stewardship framework going forward. Once you've done that, and there are certain operators out there that are absolutely doing that, and they're in the audience here. So call out to Russell Hoss from Passions of Paradise, Paradise and a big call out there to Mr. Eric Fisher. You guys went out to his hunting ground the other day. That, ladies and gentlemen, is site stewardship right there. Now, once you've got that prerequisite, this is for all tourism operators and marine park, then we can start talking about actually managing disturbances and actually assisting recovery and then any other thing you want to get into. So in a way, this is like wearing Crocs. I've been wearing Crocs since time began and I don't wear Crocs because they're cool, even though obviously I am. I'm wearing Crocs because they work, full stop. So we're focusing on what's works, not just because it's cool and everyone wants to do it and throw money at you. So if we break those five pillars down, the first big pillar is all about environmental protection. So there's a whole raft of things in there, obviously beginning with uh, our, our indigenous owners, the traditional owners of the land, but there's a whole bunch of other things in there and we won't go into all the detail, but that's just a, actually the, the, top, the top handful of them. There's many more than that. Second thing in that pillar was know your site, and that's where I come in. So Iron the Reef is central to all of that. You, you need to, you, you can't just rock up and go, I want to do this. Why? 
how, well, tell me about your site. I don't know, there's some fish and some coral. Like, no, that's not acceptable. You need to know what you're talking about if you want to go and do stuff there. So there's a great wealth of science out there now. And certainly the, the Iron Reef System at Tourism Sites is the main one for that. So focusing on that for a second, I'm going to pick up the pace loop. We're running out of time. So this is Iron Reef. This is the very core, the foundation, the very central reinforced Rio Bard concrete pillar of site stewardship. And this started way back in the day. Hello, with industry. Yes, it was actually an industry-led concept. But over the years, as time has gone by, the iron reef system has been uh, validated and reviewed and things added to it. And it started off pretty slow, as you can see, for the first sort of 20 odd years. And then we jumped to the last decade, it, it picks up the pace. We added bleach watch, we added nature diaries, all sorts of reporting stuff has come through. And then more recently, uh, we've got rapid monitoring, which is for communities and, and also for sea country as well, if anyone's interested, looking at sea country values. And in a nutshell, again, this is the power of the data. Right down the bottom there is an example. That's Mr. Eric Fisher's data there on display. And that just shows how incredibly powerful it is to simply be in your water with your customers, delivering a, an experience and just keeping an eye on things, literally just keeping an eye on things every day, week by week, year by year, incredibly powerful data there. And that's just one bunch of examples there of the, of the, the four big impacts and also wildlife. Now we've, uh, since then, we've decided we're gonna go bananas basically. So the first thing we do is a review of the method. So this is a, just an ex a screenshot of the, just an Excel spreadsheet of every conceivable coral reef monitoring program in the world sort of deeply analyzed. And we analyzed it for what can it actually deliver in terms of data value, uh, practicality value, uh, as, as well as educational value, which is an important point, the educational value. So here's that real example. Uh, this is Eric's site, and uh, there's Eric's mud map of where he has the customer experience with GPS a track, and now we're adding photo points. Because for the first time, what we're doing is that we are quantifying the long-term history of impacts on the reef with photo points. And we're about to embark on a big program with Ames and their loggers as well. So that third pillar of all those pillars we were talking about, and I've only got two minutes left, uh, is the interpretation education, or as I said before, getting your message right. So there's a whole raft of tools we use there. So there's uh, the Bear Marine Models for a Day program that's running with schools. There's our Master Reef Guides, which are really elevating the education side of things. There's a lot going on. The Reef Discovery course, which is available for the entire tourism industry. And there's at least one operator who's said, yep, all our crew are now doing the Reef Discovery course. So that's like 50 crew now of getting that high-end high -end knowledge coming in, including a whole module on Indigenous culture and respect. So in the end, we're going to apply all of those, pre those three prerequisites to a whole system framework for site stewardship. I don't know why I'm reading that. You can read. And uh, there's that fourth one, again, that manages disturbances, so things we can do, crown of thorns, repellent snail, those are, the, those are the big top two right there because they are by far and away the single most effective thing you can do at a site are those things, certainly at scale. And of course, the other things they scroll down the line, once again, COTS is their front foremost number one. It is so, so effective. And we'll come up right now with stewardship plans. This is, uh, these are the strategic outcomes. Um, I sent the, uh, sent the uh, stewardship plans through, but evidently didn't make it. They're quite, quite sexy. If you want to have a look at one, I've got one over there. Uh, basically, we're just gathering all the information together into a, a plan where each operator writes, gets all their material down in there. We put on a map, we use Google Earth, and then we have a whole plan centered around that data. But uh, that was, as I said, it didn't make it to the, didn't make it to the slides. But if you if you're keen and interested. I've got some on the laptop there and I can show you. But that's the final outcome there is, is where we're headed for. Everything's going to fit into all, you know, all the corporate plans, the blueprint, tourism management action strategy, and also Reef 2050. So that is pretty much me. That should be the last slide. Yep. Cool. Thanks for your time, guys.